Okay, good morning. We are so excited to welcome you here to our first presentation during the day in the cafeteria. HCAM is here to record this for us so that for those that weren't able to view, they can watch it on HCAM. We'll send out the PowerPoint to families, again, that weren't able to be here. We intentionally don't send it in advance because we do want you to try to attend if you're able. And sometimes we add so much more with our discussions um, to the PowerPoints based on what you have to share, based on examples that um, we have. So I know you, welcome. My name is Lauren Dubow, the principal of Marathon. We have also presenting with us our assistant principal, Shannon Dickerson, and our guidance counselor, Kelly Pickens. So our goal for um, the session today is to share strategies for how you can support your child's social emotional um, development at home. It's a process, it's a continuum. It's nothing that you're ever all done with. It's not as if there are 26 letters, you learn 26 and you know your letters. As adults, we're building on expanding and refining our social emotional skills and some of you throughout the presentation might think of some that you know that have more to go and grow in those areas even as um, adults with that and that's okay that's okay so welcome we have a sheet if you'd like to take some notes um, at the end we'll have questions and discussions um, to hopefully provide some added insight if you need and mrs. Pickens is going to get us started off thank you so we're going to um, talk a little bit about what is social emotional learning. SEL is a big trend right now. Of course, because we are elementary school, we focus a lot on this. Children come to us with all different levels um, and skills. So if you look at this nice little wheel, let's see if I can do this. Um, I can't. <laughs> there we go. Yep, there it is. OK. Um, there are all these different areas of competency that we talk about. So we'll start with self-awareness. Self-awareness just means understanding how you feel. So if you live with a little person and they're angry and they're crying and they throw themselves on the ground and you say, are you mad? And they scream at you, I'm not mad. That's that self-awareness piece that we try to work on. So really trying to help children identify how they're feeling. And so a really simple way to do that is to give them those words. So. If someone's upset, you can say, I can see that you're angry now. After you say that enough times, we say at school, after you say things a hundred times, it definitely gets in. Sometimes you have to say it a lot. Or, I can see that you're feeling frustrated. What can we do to help you? Um, so really giving them those words, or I can tell you're really excited. That's self-awareness and helping them understand how they're feeling. The next area there is called self-management. So it's once you know how you're feeling, how do you manage those emotions. So uh, maybe it's your birthday and you're six and you're super excited. Is that okay to run through the house, ripping things off the walls? No, it's okay to be super excited, but we have to teach the children how to kind of manage those emotions. So you might say something like, I know you're really excited, it's your birthday. What can we do to try to keep your body calm? And we're gonna talk about our zones later, that's a strategy we use. but. That's the management piece, is really understanding how you feel and then how do you manage those emotions. Um, social awareness is another really important area for us here at school. Social awareness is not only just thinking about yourself, but it really leads into empathy about thinking about what's happening around you and what's happening with other people around you. So let's say you're um, out at recess and someone falls, your friend falls and skins their knee and they're crying. Um, do you just run right by them or what would you do? What could you do? So we talk with children a lot about just being aware or even you leave the classroom and your class was on the rug and then you come back and they're all sitting at their desks. You need to take a look around, be aware. What's everyone else doing? Those are your social cues. So that's social awareness. Uh, relationship skills. We do that all the time, every minute. Relationship <laughs> skills on the bus, in the cafeteria. Um, at recess and even in the classroom, children are doing a lot of group work together. Um, it's the best way for them to learn when they're talking with each other, but we talk with children about um, not being too bossy, making sure everyone has a turn, making sure that you are expressing what you need to, but in a way that is kind to other people as well. So getting your point across, we'll talk a little bit later too about some more strategies for that. Um, and responsible decision making, that's kind of our ultimate goal, putting everything together and then being able to make good choices. And those are the words we use a lot here at Marathon. We talk a lot about good choices. Was that a good choice? Should we rewind? Let's see if we can make a good choice. 
Um, so that is social emotional learning in a nutshell. I think we're going to show a quick video. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And while this isn't making our voice louder for you, what it is helping is HCAM. So later when this is played, those at home watching will hear us. So here's a quick video about what is social emotional learning, sums up what Mrs. Pickens said, and also just gives an example of, you know, what that means. So we are. There's a lot of talk these days about SEL, social emotional learning, but what exactly is it? Social emotional learning is the process of learning social and emotional skills, and it's just as important as learning reading or math. This learning process is most effective when it begins early and continues through high school. Social emotional skills are essential for success in school, work, and life. With SEL, students learn to manage their own emotions and behaviors, have empathy and show care and concern for others, solve problems effectively, make responsible decisions, and maintain healthy relationships. Students learn to recognize what's happening inside them and to be aware of their emotions, which helps them deal with strong emotions and impulsive behaviors. It helps them stop, take a breath, and think about a situation before acting. Students learn to identify others' emotions and perspectives, which helps them empathize and show compassion, no matter who they are or what their background is. It's not difficult to imagine how this is important in the classroom and in life. Students learn to solve problems in peaceful ways and communicate assertively about what they need or want. This helps them get along with other students and get the help they need from adults. When students learn to make responsible decisions about their lives and their future, things can turn out better. Research shows social-emotional learning makes a difference. Students who participate in SEL do better academically, have improved attitudes and behaviors, and act in delinquent or disruptive ways less often. In the United States, students with strong social-emotional competence are twice as likely to earn a college degree and nearly 50% more likely to graduate from high school and have a full-time job by age 25. Just as important, students who are socially and emotionally competent have more friends. This means they're more likely to feel connected to school and do well, and less likely to be left out or bullied. Simply put, by participating in social-emotional learning, students learn the skills to succeed in every facet of school and the rest of their lives. We always say that we're building a foundation at Marathon, and we are, and that applies not only to academics, but these social-emotional um, competencies, these skills. And children just don't automatically have them. You can't just say, stop that, do this. Sometimes as parents, we do. Um, but they don't know where to begin. They need the support and the guidance and the modeling, which we'll talk about, to help develop those skills. Um, and they will develop over time. What's key is children to understand it's a learning process, children don't always make the right choice, the best choice, the safe choice. Our goal at school is we build those strategies and those competencies, that's teaching too, so that the next time they encounter that experience, they make a better, safer choice and they understand why. Um, quite often when children talk to us at the office, it's different than when we were in school ourselves and the, your limited relationship with administration might have been if you were not doing something right. We are cheerleaders. We, we are part of support teams. Children come earn breaks with us. They read with us. They get stickers with us. And then we, we give them thumbs up. Nice job. I know you're working really hard on that and I noticed that. So getting that feedback of, hey, you're making some good choices is important for our kids to hear along the way. Now, at home, how can you do some of these things at home? So talking about feelings, something that children come to us with at this age, they have a few basic feelings. They're bored, they're, they're, they're mad, um, 
and maybe hung hungry. You know, it's what I'm just alluding to, there's a few basic, and they overgeneralize what their feelings are. So when, as Mrs. Pickens said, you see your child on their birthday and they're super excited and they're sort of full of energy, you can use that word excitement. Wow, you are excited. This is a fantastic day. How special that is. You look excited. It's almost I liken it to when your child was first trying foods, they needed to heat, try those foods multiple times before they liked them. To build vocabulary and labeling feelings, children need to hear them multiple times. And what's most effective is when they're experiencing it and know, this is excitement. This is a good thing. I kind of like this. It's a little wild because I don't know how to control it, um, but it seems pretty good. Also, when kids are, are mad or they're worried, or um, sometimes children will often confuse worried and mad and we help I, it looks like something's bothering you and we'll talk with children and instead of just asking how are you feeling because quite often we'll get those basic responses back I'm bored you know and and we can tell they're not bored but they just don't know what to call it they know it doesn't feel good they know they're not excited um, so we do a lot of navigating so when you're with your child at home at the store in line that long line at the grocery store you can talk about your own feelings too wow this is a really long line I'm a little frustrated because I know we have some place to go like you can share that you have feelings too and that's great for children to see that okay I, my mom and dad feel this way my babysitter my grandmother feels this way they're doing a pretty good job of keeping it together because um, we'll talk about that later is how you model when you're feeling different things but it's good for them to see that Feelings impact adults and children alike. Um, when you are in the morning and you're rushing and um, someone spills your travel coffee mug all over the kitchen island, they're watching you. They will know what you say. They will know how you react. And they know you do that when you're frustrated because then we've seen that come out here at school and they don't always know what those words mean, but they know that you say it when you're frustrated. Um, and then we've got some teaching to do. So it's really hard, but when something like that happens to you, you've got an early meeting and gosh darn, it just spilled all down your outfit, that travel coffee mug. Um, you can stop in. I am really frustrated. I, I am so busy today. I don't have time. Like label that emotion, um, which is hard for adults because sometimes you say words that we say aren't appropriate for school. Um, and uh, kids pick up everything. They pick up how you're feeling, but they will know you're frustrated. They'll know you're upset. They'll know that you might model some deep breaths. <sighs> Okay, I need some help. Maybe you ask them for help. Can you get the paper towels? And that would be great. Um, when you make a mistake, acknowledge it. It's okay for kids to see that we're not perfect. Something that is quite disheartening to see is even at our level, pre-K-1, we have children who don't want to make a mistake. They think they have to be perfect all the time. And that is, that is not a good feeling to have. That's a lot of pressure. It induces a lot of anxiety. So when you make a mistake, acknowledge it. You know, I've done that a number of times. Once we got settled at the start of school, um, we did our announcements and I welcomed everybody to have a thrilling Thursday. Well, guess what? It wasn't Thursday. So I think, <laughs> I think I was so excited to be in our new building and finally get our stuff going and I had the wrong day of the week um, and the whole school heard it. But part of it is for kids to say, Mrs. Dubow, it's not Thursday. Oh my gosh, I, I, my goodness, I am, you know, how did I handle that? And what's nice is the kids will say when you do something like that in an appropriate way. So they know, hey, did you know it's not Thursday? And sometimes when they're the first one to tell me, I say, oh my goodness, you are right. But just modeling that. There are times that um, if, if I'm writing something on a chart paper and maybe I forget a word because my brain is ahead of myself or somebody will correct me, oh my goodness, you know what? I can just cross that off and put it up here. I don't need to rip it off and start with a fresh sheet of paper. And some of you might see that already with your children at home. They don't want to use an eraser. They want a perfect piece of paper. They, and getting comfortable with a flaw is a good thing 
and how can you move on with that and that's hard a lot of our kids get really stuck on that so there are times if you make if you make a wrong turn in the car oh my goodness now I've got to go around the block all right we'll get there we'll get there I mean so talking yourself through things like that so your children can see that adults make mistakes too and it's okay it is okay um, and those turn into learning opportunities so um, you know the coffee mug maybe Maybe it shouldn't be made and put right at the edge of the island. Or maybe maybe that should be done a little earlier. Whatever it might be. For me, I check the calendar, so I usually get the right day of the week now with announcements. But just, okay, so how can I work on that so maybe it's different next time? And it still might not be perfect, but knowing that you're learning, you're making that effort to do a better job, that's what's most important for kids to know. We had an author visit us um, this fall, Brian Lees, and he he visited us before he won the Caldecott Award. So the first graders wrote him congratulations letters. It was wonderful. But something he shared with the students of how often he draws and illustrates, he said, because practice makes better. And that's what you want to be. It's not practice makes perfect, but it makes you better. Um, and when you are working through something such as that, label it for your children, narrate. Remember when they were learning to talk and you did so much talking, there's the ball, you put it in the basket, nice job. When you're going through situations that have a variety of emotions or you're working through a problem that you're solving, kind of label that for kids so they see your actions being matched with the words and they're learning, oh, that's they just solved a problem. They just made a mistake and it's okay because they're not necessarily going to internalize and pick up everything that you're doing so at this age we do a lot of narrating um, with that and when they do something we acknowledge with specific praise mrs. Pickens I noticed that you're waiting very quietly and patiently great job if I just said great job mrs. Pickens she doesn't know what I meant great job great job matching her clothes today great job putting some books out like she might have her own opinion and be like yes I worked really hard on my hair thank you but but if but if I am saying what she did, she now knows I'm, waiting is really hard for me and you notice that. So catching kids being good, we talk about that a lot. It's reinforcing for them so that when we see they are working hard, waiting their turn, working out a problem, moving on from perhaps a mistake, it gives them that motivation of, okay, hey, I'm doing a good job here, I'm getting there. The power of yet. Yet is a big word. Three letters, but a really big word. So a lot of what Lauren said actually touches base on what we're going to talk about here. But I found this quote that um, kind of sums up this growth mindset, which I'll talk a little bit about, and that the perfectionists in your children, and so that we're all learners. So I'm going to read you this quote. One of the most powerful truths that we can offer our children is the knowledge that we are all still learning. None of us have arrived. We all have room to grow. This frees our kids from expecting perfection of themselves or anyone else because they know that life is a journey from day one on. And I think that's such a powerful quote as this, the power of yet, a growth mindset. Carol Dweck is... Um, a person who coined this phrase, fixed mindset, growth mindset. Growth mindset is that we're all learners and that you can, you believe in yourself that you can get smarter, that you can learn things and progress, putting forth effort, persevering, and practicing. Just what Brian Lee said, that quote, practice makes better. It's not practice makes perfect. No one's ever perfect. You're growing each and every day. You're learning each and every day. And when you talk through a situation as an adult and you're saying things for your kids, that lets them see that you're still growing too. You're still learning. This is something you do every day. And oh, today you're doing it a little differently. The power of yet is that if you look at those staircases, I won't do it. A lot of kids at school, I won't do it. They, they think they can't, I can't do this. Uh, maybe I'll try with some encouragement. Maybe I'll try a little bit more, see if I can do this, maybe do a couple more problems. Maybe I'll read a few more words. And every little step gets them to further their knowledge, further their experiences. As a classroom teacher, I used to always talk to my kids about the power of yet. Think about when you were a baby and they're like, oh, that was so long ago. They're five and six and seven years old. 
But when they think about a toddler, think about you were crawling. You didn't know how to run. You didn't know how to climb the jungle gym. You didn't know how to climb to the top of the slide and slide down by yourself. You couldn't do that yet, and now you can. What's that next step? Where's that next yet? What are, what are you working towards? And as a parent, as an adult in their lives, we always talk to them about that. What are you working towards? How can you get there? What are the small steps you need to make to get to that step? That's one, maybe it's one more word you write on your page that day. Maybe it's you read two pages more in that book. All those little things help your child know that it's okay to make a mistake. It's okay to try and maybe not succeed that first time. It's that try, try again. If they see you trying different things, they're gonna know that it's okay for themselves to try. This growth mindset is something even five and six and seven year olds can understand. They can understand that right now they might not be able to do something, but that if they work at it, whoop, uh-oh. So now we'll Sorry, in and here we go. It's <laughs> modeling, this is just a little glitch. <laughs> Sorry so about that. So I'll keep talking. <laughs> um, a lot of things that you do too is you talk about when they start kindergarten, when they start first grade. What is it something that they didn't know how to do and now they can? When your child comes home, instead of saying, great job, like Lauren said, you need to label it. When you're watching them in their baseball game, great hit. I love how you hit the ball and that you ran to first grade great base with all your might. When you label it, instead of saying great job, oh, good work, that really doesn't mean anything. Someone says great job to me, I'm like, all right, what did I do that was so great? It's hard as a parent, you just want to do the easy compliment. Think about being specific, and that's that growth mindset, is when you are specific, your child then hears it, and they're, ah, mom or dad, they noticed that I really tried hard when I was running to first base. Oh, mom or dad noticed when I really tried to pack my backpack on my own and everything didn't fit, but I tried. My son was learning to tie his shoes. It was torturous, but we kept saying, try, keep trying, you've got it. All right, now cross there and talking him through it. And then he did it and the excitement it's, it's unbelievable when you see them acknowledge that they did something on their own. And when you're able to give them those specifics, that's that growth mindset. Knowing that you can get smarter, that you can learn more, that you can always progress. And as adults, we're always learning too. And to say to your kids, oh, I learned something new today. Oh, guess what I learned today? And giving them that little piece of information. Oh, mom and dad didn't know that. Oh, my babysitter didn't know that, and now they do. Everything you do, they see. Everything you say, <laughs> they hear. <laughs> so it's a part of being a parent and being their first teacher. That's your role. We all are their second, third, fourth teachers. You're their first teacher. So if you can give them that positive growing experience, then they're going to continue to thrive. And now some exciting stuff so this is a program called zones of regulation it really speaks to those first couple areas of competency that we talked to a little while ago um, self-awareness and self-regulation and so every single kindergarten and first grade classroom has had this lesson and i know they use it in the preschool as well so i've done this lesson i think 29 times <laughs> So today's the 30th time, here we go. Um, so somebody really smart took um, feelings and identified them as colors, kind of what Disney did with the movie Inside Out. This is a little bit simpler, but it's something that kids really get. And it's so cute because now they'll walk down the hall and be like, Miss Pickens, I was in the blue zone today. And I'm like, thank you for telling me. Um, so what, we've what they've done is for zones, they've um, identified feelings as colors. And so the blue zone, is when you're a little sad or tired. We talk about Monday mornings are blue zones. Um, and so, you know, how do you get your body going when you're in the blue zone? Green zone is where we want to be. Green zone is your happy place. It is ready to learn. And the kids all know this. Or we'll say to them, are you in the green zone? We need to get in the green zone now. Are we ready to go? Yellow zone is when you're either worried or a little wiggly. There's lots of different um, words there. Sometimes we just simplify it for the children too. It can be if you're a little bit frustrated 
or getting a little bit excited as well. That's the yellow zone. Usually you see the yellow zone because their bodies are moving and moving and moving and we're trying to get them to calm down. So that's the yellow zone. The red zone is when you're really, really angry. And so we talk about um, it's okay to be in any of those zones. It's okay to feel any of those feelings. It's just what you do with those feelings that is you have to be careful with. So we talk a lot at Marathon School about it's okay to be in the red zone. Um, we know you can't hurt people. That means you can't hit and you can't say mean words that hurt people on the inside. Um, I love to ask the children when we're doing this lesson, which zone do you think is the hardest one for you? They're usually very accurate. They'll say to me, oh, I'm always in the yellow zone or, oh, I'm always in the blue zone. They really identify and they'll know which one is the hardest one for them. Um, after we help the children um, identify what zone they're in, then we talk about strategies. So we'll say, okay, I think um, you're in the yellow zone. What should we do? Do we need to take a walk? Do we need to get a drink of water? Should we put on a little, um, the children do something called Go Noodle. It's a little video they put on the classroom on the whiteboard and the kids will dance or wiggle or get their wiggles out for a little bit and then they'll be ready to sit down and get working again. Um, if you're feeling a little tired, did you have breakfast? Do you need your snack? Do you need a walk? What do we need to do to wake up your body? So we talk a lot about the strategies, how to get your body back in the green zone and ready to learn. And um, we also use these in all the specials. So Mr. Norton uses it in PE. They use it in health and art and music. Um, it's a curriculum that's used throughout the whole school. So. It's a really nice way for young children to kind of identify how they're feeling and then talk about the strategies for how to, to manage those feelings. Um, this information is all available. You can just Google it on the web. Um, and Lauren has, yeah, Lauren's attached some really nice parent links as well on this presentation, which will be on the school website. But this is a really nice way at home. You know, if you notice your, your little person and sometimes you know, some of them can have very delicate feelings, so you don't want to like call them out right away. I, even at school, will say to someone like, oh, I think you're in the yellow zone. What do you think? And then have them talk about it. It's not like, oh my gosh, you're so wiggly, pull it together, you know, because then they're feeling like, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. It's okay to have that feeling. I'll say, if you're feeling very wiggly, what do you think you can do? What works for you? We also have um, color buckets over here. So there's the green zone bucket, the yellow zone bucket, the blue zone bucket, and the red zone bucket. There are also links to the presentation with um, some really great stories. I love um, literature at this age. There's so much wonderful children's literature to be able to read to them. Books about what do you do when you're really angry? What do you do if you're feeling really wiggly? What kinds of things, what happens with these characters in the stories? Can I use some of those strategies in my own life? And the children really respond well. So sometimes they'll end up in my office and I'll say, oh my goodness, do we need to get something from the red bucket? They'll be like, yes, the red bucket. There's the red bucket. We also use something called a calm down bucket and I will talk a little bit more about calming later too. But Sometimes children just need that concrete physical thing. What can I do to help feel better? And, and they just need that practice that we talked about, lots and lots of practice. So now you are all, I say to the children, you are all zones experts now. <laughs> now you know what the zones are and you can ask your children. They'll probably love to tell you about uh, what they've learned. Um, and you will see these visuals in every classroom in the building. So now you know it. Thank you. Okay, so this next slide, um, playing fair means not letting them win. And this is actually one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, playing games with your children. Now, one of the things that is really hard when you're a parent is you want to let them win. When you play Candyland, shoots and ladders, when you're playing checkers, you might not make those moves because you want to let them win. Those of you who have come to the kindergarten screening have heard me talk about this. As a classroom teacher, I had a first grader who the first time he lost a game was in the classroom. He had never lost, he was seven. First time he lost the checkers game, I think it was checkers, might have been chess, he flipped the board, threw pieces, and started screaming, crying, stomping his feet. He had never lost a game in his life. So I had the parents come in and we talked about it and the dad said, of course I always let him win. And I said, you're actually doing a huge disservice to your child. 
and it's really hard as parents. You want to teach them winning. It's great. Oh, yay, happy you won the game. You're actually doing a huge disservice. You need to let them understand that it's okay to lose. It's okay for mom or dad to beat you. And you need to set that example that if you, if they do win, and they really do win, that you're a gracious loser. Great game, maybe we can play again tomorrow. Ah, oh, I love that you made that move. That was the winning move. Maybe next time I'll try that. And giving them those examples and modeling what it's like to be a gracious loser. What it's like to be a gracious winner. Not, yay, woohoo, I won, dancing around the room, which your child will do when they win, <laughs> is you, you win the game. Oh, great game. Maybe we can play again. Again, those same things. My son loves best two out of three. He always, if he lost the first, he'd say two out of three, and he'd want to keep playing the game. And even I gave this example. Sunday night, we were playing Monopoly. He chose the game. He was losing. He was not happy. He's like, I'm, I'm going to have to quit. And I said, you chose the game. He goes, okay, we'll play to the end. And I said, great game. Next time, what are some strategies you can do? Oh, I should buy more properties. But he knew that it was okay for him to lose. We'd play the game again. I do feel bad for him having me and my husband as a parent, two and three. He wasn't winning games. <laughs> we were not letting him win. And, but he learned to be a gracious loser. He learned to be a gracious winner. He loves playing games because he knows there's that chance. There's the chance mom or dad might lose. I might really win. There's the chance I might lose, but we can play again. And the quote that's on the um, PE in the gym is, if you had fun, you won. That's the thing about playing games. If you had fun, it's about the fun. It's about learning the rules. It's about learning strategies. It's about acknowledging to your child, I know you're a little frustrated right now. I know, oh yeah, do you, you probably should have made that move. Next time you'll remember that. All those things, it's about playing that game and having fun with your child. Don't make the first time they lose be at school. It's really hard for them. And that father I talked about, he emailed me the next day. I beat him at Candyland, he wasn't happy. And I said, great, do it again. And the next time I saw him, it was probably a week later, he was picking up his son. He said, he's lost a few more times. The board didn't get flipped last night. Great. But those are those things. They, the dad never thought that he should Lose a game. I should always let my kid win. Well, in sports, when they're playing on teams, they don't always win either. And those are the things that they need to learn at this age so that as they get older, they understand that it's about the game. It is, it's about having fun. And yes, sometimes it is about winning and losing, but how are you a gracious winner? How are you a gracious loser? And how do you express that as an adult so they see it? And you can say, oh, I wish I had made that move. Okay, next time I'm gonna remember that. And just those pieces, I, I love being able to talk to this about parents because it was such an eye-opening moment for one of the parents that I had their child that I made sure to talk about it all the time with every parent. And I see a lot of you nodding, so you probably do let them win all the time. Play a game tonight, don't let them win. I mean, if they do, that's great but play to the best of your abilities because then they become better players too and you become a better player too. But it is all about playing fair means not always letting them win. It means playing by the rules, being a gracious winner, being a gracious loser, and modeling those ways that you guys can have fun together while playing a game. So now if they've lost the game, <laughs> calming. So these are strategies that will work with children and we'll use it when we reference the green zone and children are not in the green zone and they're upset. They might be headed to the red zone or in the red zone. How do we get back to the green zone? Because just saying, oh, let's get back to the green zone, as Mrs. Pickens said, they need strategies and tools to help get them there. So these are some of the things that we use here at school. Flower breaths. So do you want to demonstrate that? We. When we do flower breaths, it's almost imagine what you would do with a dandelion. We take deep breath in. So you hold your flower. This is, again, it's concrete, so you hold your flower. You want to smell the flower. That's getting them to breathe in through their nose. So you breathe in. You hold it in your belly for three seconds, and then you breathe out your mouth. 
We do three of them. Sometimes we do more, depending on how calm we need to get or how excited we get. And just physically slowing your body down, it helps. It's hard to be really angry when you're holding the breath. You're letting it out slowly. Um, that's a strategy that will work. So if you hear your children say, well, I take flower breaths, that's what that means. We also... Um, we have, this is from center school. We have some here. They're just tucked in different places. Um, we have hall breaks, body breaks. Something that we know also works well with children is to get movement involved. You know, when we were in school, you pretty much, you didn't have a whole lot of movement during the day. We purposely plan movement. This child is doing um, wall push-ups, so you can do this anywhere. You literally have your hands against the wall, and you're getting that heavy feedback and movement with your body back and forth. Sometimes kids will do five, they'll do 10. We do cross crawls, we do um, frog jumps, all different things that will we'll take breaks. So sometimes children will do them in their class, they'll step outside in the hallway. But again, just getting that body moving can help shift where your mind is at that point. We count back, um, sometimes from five, sometimes from 10, but we count, not a running race to count fast, but just say those numbers, count back. Here's a child just taking some of those breaths and just feeling how their body feels and fills up and, and letting that air go. Sometimes we'll have children think of their happy place. Um, and, uh, and I know Mrs. Pickens has done this and children will have a picture of where their happy place is. And it's different for all children. It might be the park, it might be the beach, it might be their tree house, where it might be their bedroom. Wherever their happy place is, think of that and it has good thoughts come and that helps you calm. Something else that we've used are sensory bottles. Sometimes we'll make them out of water bottles, put doodads in them. You can buy different ones. Um, you know, you don't always have to buy things. Sometimes around your house, that was from a kaleidoscope. Here's one that's made out of a water bottle. And sometimes just watching the different things fall or move can be quite relaxing for children. Um, there are times um, when you have something in the mail and you've got bubble um, wrap, save the bubble wrap. Sometimes you can squeeze, you can tis, uh, twist that. When it's really big, you can stomp on it and um, break that. Something else that, um, Shannon shared that she had done before was children would have water and they would pour it, do this over the sink, mind you, from one cup to another. Just something soothing about that and shifting the water, which, you know, just take any plastic cup or whatnot from, from your cabinet so it's not something that you have to go out and buy, but just that motion, sometimes water can be very soothing. Um, throughout our school, each classroom has a take a break chair. It is not a disciplined time out. It is a place to help collect your thoughts, get yourself back to the green zone. Um, so now all of those chairs are green in all of the rooms. So it's you know, if you're in the art room, if you're in PE, if you're in a classroom, Everybody knows what that chair means. It's consistent throughout the building. While we were at center school, it varied throughout the buildings. And one day going into a classroom to, to conduct an observation, I sat down and lo and behold, I sat down in the take a break chair. But didn't one little friend tell me that? Hey, you're in the take a break chair. And I went, oh, thank you. I, I need a break. So I just had to take that moment and model that sometimes I need to take a break and I think they were kind of surprised but sometimes we'll do that as an adult and model that you know what I'm very overwhelmed right now I'm a little stressed I can feel myself getting to the green zone I need to take a break and um, then they're kind of surprised and just like wow adults need that too okay that's good to know but I just I, I'll never forget that like hey you're in the take a break chair. Um, so at your house, you might have a, a bean bag, a chair, a rocking chair. We all talked in our houses. We always used a stair. Here, sit with this on the bottom step and use uh, something, a kitchen timer. Use it if your child benefits from watching something change, that can happen. Or if it's just belly breaths. Mrs. Pickens has a bucket of things over here that later you can look at that have a variety of calming things. Sometimes we use pictures and visuals, um, you know, silly putty, squeeze balls, you know, so many different things that you might find. And maybe it's toys that your child doesn't play with anymore. Repurpose them. So now that you had a scrunchy ball, maybe that goes into a bucket. We use them at school and it's like fidget toys, but they're tools. We call them tools because you can use them to help get yourself um, to another place. And then we have to work on problems. Yeah. So a problem. 
When we think about a problem, a problem is something that's unexpected. It's not a part of your plan. It's not something that you thought was going to happen, and now here it is. We talk to kids a lot about the size of your problem, and the size definitely, which Mrs. Pickens will talk about, dictates how you react to it. A small problem, your shoe's untied. You don't need to drop to the ground and cry. Your shoe's untied. We used to call it a glitch at my old school. It's a glitch in your day. Your pencil doesn't have an eraser. That's a glitch. That's a small problem. What is it that it's, that's really going on? And it might be that it's just something as little as that. Sometimes the problems get a little bigger. It's cold outside. I don't have a jacket. Oh, what, what can I do? Oh, these are things that as a parent, you can help label for your child. Labeling the problem. Oh, that's a small problem. We can fix that. And the feelings that you have. Problems aren't good. They don't make you feel happy. They might make you feel upset or sad or angry. Maybe you're a little nervous about walking into a room full of adults and having to talk. It's a little bit of a problem. What are you going to do about it? And then your reaction. One of the things with problems is that sometimes it has nothing to do what's going on with your child at that moment. And that's what we find a lot here at school, is that someone all of a sudden sitting there nicely doing their work, and then they've thrown their paper across the table. How you get their paper, you look at, everything looks correct. And thinking about, hmm, what's going on today? Maybe not saying, what's wrong? but saying, did something happen today that made you upset? They might be thinking about the bus ride and their friend didn't sit with them on the bus. And now it's 12. The bus happened at 8.30 this morning. Being able to question your child and give them some different words, some different scenarios, it might not be related to exactly what's going on at that moment. And I think that's hard for young children is they can't always tell you what the problem is, but they know something's making them not feel right. Something's making them feel anxious. Something's making them a little angry. They keep things in their head for the longest periods of time. And they'll tell you, someone said to me this morning, it's wet outside. And I said, I know. It's like, oh, I can't believe it's wet. And I said, I know. Do you know what happened last night? Yesterday when we left school, it was raining. I said, you're right. Is that why it's wet? Oh yeah. And then he walked on his way. But at that moment, it was a problem, it was wet. My guess is he was thinking about recess and he was thinking about, oh, we might not be able to go outside. And he was already starting to stew on that. And I said, but it's not raining now. And he went off in his way and I'm hoping that now he's okay. <laughs> I haven't seen him yet, but I'll go check on him later. But it's those simple things of being able to help your child label the problem. Is this a small problem? Is this a little bit of a medium problem? Or is this a big problem? We also used to talk about in my old school, a natural disaster, kids' reactions. And a true natural disaster, we would really tell them, that is a tornado. That is a blizzard. That reaction you're having right now doesn't match that your paper has a rip in it. And I think when you're able to give your children those examples and you're able to label it, and when you label your own problems, oh, that's a problem. That's a pretty medium-sized problem. My coffee just spilled everywhere. Now we might be a little bit late. It's not an astronomical, not a natural disaster. We're going to have to clean it up, but we'll get through it. Oh, I can't find my other shoe. It's a small problem. I've got other pairs of shoes I can wear today. Now that might be something that they're going to stew on the rest of the day. And when they come home, they're going to be upset that they didn't wear their purple shoes to school. And you're going to think back, oh, what is it that maybe they're thinking about? What is it that happened during the day? And I think those are the things that, as a parent, thinking about the questions you ask, not necessarily saying, what's wrong? But did something happen at school? Did something happen on the bus ride? And giving them different examples helps them figure out what that problem is and maybe then ways that you can help them react. And I'll pass it on to you. Hold this for Kelly here. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about, oh, thank you, real problems. Again, this is a really fun lesson that the kids love to do in the classroom. 
So we have a bucket, a big bucket for big problems, a medium bucket for medium problems, and a teeny tiny bucket for little tiny problems. And these little slips of paper have real problems that happen during the day. Um, it might be kind of fun to do something like this at home, um, or even the little chart that was on the slide right before here. You know, you could make that chart and say like, okay, let's look, is this a small, a medium, a big problem? Um, what we talk about with the children is if it is a small problem, it's something you can um, fix yourself. And we're really trying to help the children be independent. So we talk a lot about how most problems that happen during the day are small problems. Um, and so you want to have a small reaction to a small problem. The hard part is getting the children to um, agree that it's a small problem because for them sometimes everything is a big problem. So an example is I had a little boy one year in kindergarten and he, he had pretzels for a snack and he loved his pretzels and half of the pretzels fell on the floor. And so he spent the next 30 minutes crying about the half of the pretzels on the floor and he never got to eat the half that were still on his table because he was so upset. He had a huge big reaction to something. So um, when we talk about this with children, again, it's all about modeling and doing like a little role play with them. So when you think about a small problem and you could think about something that happens at home, just like um, I think Shannon just said like, oh, I can't find my shoes or um, I can't, there's, uh, my favorite snack is all gone. You know, there's none, none of those Scooby-Doo cookies left and I'm so upset. Um, and we model for them. So what we're learning a lot now and research is showing is that when you model by saying the words out loud, they start to internalize them. So you can say, oh dear, I know you love those Scooby-Doo cookies and there are none left. What could we do that might make you feel better? Maybe you could say in your head, maybe after school tonight we'll get to the grocery store and we'll get some more of those scooby-doo cookies just saying that sometimes helps and say oh okay then i'll take pretzels today or i'll take something else um, when we do this lesson with the children they look at the slips at the end we hold up the buckets and we show them that most of the problems are small problems and that they can fix them themselves and really help them be independent medium problems we say to the children are problems that you need an adult to help you fix so um, an example might be that you fell and got hurt. You have to go to the nurse because you want to get that cut cleaned out or you need a Band-Aid. Or we broke the lamp at home and you need a grown-up to help you because there are sharp things um, that have to be cleaned up. So medium, re medium problems have a medium reaction. You, we model again. We say to the children, oh dear, something broke. This isn't safe. I need to go get a grown-up to help me. Big problems, we call them the 911. So we try to really simplify it and not have too much discussion because sometimes this goes way off the rails and they, all they want to talk about is all the scary things they've ever heard in their whole life. But basically we'll say, if there's a fire, because we practice fire drills, that would be a 911. That is a big problem. Then it's okay to raise your voice and say, everyone get lined up right now. That's okay. Or if you've gotten hurt and you have to take a trip to the hospital and that is a long conversation they all want to talk about too. Once, I know someone. So, so those are the 911. Those are the ones that, that you have to have a lot of people help you and you usually have to make a phone call. And they'll see at the end of the lesson, there's usually two slips in the big red bucket. There's probably 10 slips in the yellow bucket, the medium size. And most of our problems that we have during the day are small problems, problems that we can solve ourselves. If your child's having a big reaction to a small problem, in the middle of the reaction is not a good time to talk about it, um, but when they're calm is a great time to talk about it. So you might say, I know you got really upset about snack this morning. We were packing snack and your favorite snack was gone and you were having a really big reaction, but that was kind of a small problem. So what could we do next time? Let's rewind it. What could we do next time that might be better? You could just say, Hey mom, if you go to the grocery store, could you get some more of my cookies? Or in our house, we keep like a little running list next to the refrigerator. You could write it on the list for me. That would be a great help. And then I'll know we need more of those cookies. So again, just a really um, concrete way for them to kind of understand size of problems and a little visual that helps as well. Thank you. Okay. So sometimes when we have problems, we have some who might bother another. Um, so something we work on is helping children, we call it be brave, to advocate for themselves. Um, as children are, are learning and making choices, they don't always make the best choice. They might be sitting really close to someone. They might sit in someone else's seat. 
Maybe they use their hands instead of their words. So we also work on not only that child making some better, safer choices, we work on the other children around to build up those advocacy skills. So often, um, we'll have children who won't speak up, if you will. Um, Shannon's sitting pretty much took my whole spot over, and I don't want to get in trouble, so I'm not going to say anything to her. We teach them it's not, it's okay to say, Shannon, you took my spot. I don't like that. And something we help, ch children do very well when we associate it with things. We'll say it's a bug wish. It bugs me when you take my spot. So we work on um, how do you say that. And children need practice with that. They're not very good at saying that bothers me. It bugs me. Um, we have uh, children who are rule followers. They want to do exactly what they're supposed to do and they think that's rude or impolite. So teaching them how to do it is also part of it. The tone of their voice. Do you say it? Do you yell it? Do you have a fist shaking as you do it? We don't really want those. So we work on how you can say what's bothering you, a bug wish. You could tell them a bug wish. Um, we encounter this a lot as we're helping um, solve problems with children that they need that adult's help. And so often children will say, that's okay, you know, after someone apologizes and then we step right in. It's actually not okay. We don't want this to happen again tomorrow. You can say, I accept your apology. Please don't do that again. I accept your apology. I don't like it when XYZ. So we're giving them that language again to say, okay, you can accept the apology, but you can add more to it. And they need that guidance, that support to do it because it's not being rude. It's not being mean. You're being brave. You're advocating for yourself. You're letting your classmate know, your friend know, you don't like that. And that bothers you. You know, it bugs me when. So you might have multiple children at home and you might see this with siblings. So this would be a great opportunity to practice this with siblings when they're not sharing their toys, when someone sits in a seat at the, at the table to eat and took somebody else's favorite seat. You know, maybe you take turns or um, however you work it out, have them say, you know, it bugs me when you do this. I wish you could do this. Um, next time I would like to sit there. And that's it's hard for young children to advocate for themselves. It really is. And it's a skill that we work on because we don't want them to always just sort of be passive and say, okay, all right, they took my seat. You don't want that for your child. It's a balance. We don't want them to be bossy, but we don't want them to sort of be pushed around um, by people who are bossy. So uh, we work on um, ba balancing um, that out for sure. So we have a, a quote here um, that, you know, it, it goes along with SEL that your practice helps shape your belief. As through the years, this has become more of a prominent um, curriculum approach throughout our schools. It's not just a lesson 30 minutes once a week. We try to live it, breathe it, have consistency throughout the building so that what I say is the same as the, the direction or information you get when you're in this class or that class, in the hall, at you know dismissal or arrival, whoever the adult is. And it becomes part of our practice. So that, that's what's important um, for us here and hopefully at home too. I've met with um, families over the years who at times have said, I don't know why you spend so much time on this, you know, because we didn't do that when I was in school. But research has shown this is an area that needs to be fostered, developed, to help children build these competencies. And if you're having difficulty in one of these areas, it's really hard to focus and learn. If I have a problem that I think is that big problem, that 911 huge problem, it's hard for me to listen to this, what this vowel team thing means with letters. Because right now, I'm not really paying attention to that because I'm worried about something else. Or if I'm in the red zone, my body's not calm, I'm really mad about something, it's hard for me to focus and learn. So studies show when we can have a handle on this and again, recognizing that all emotions are normal, what do we do with them? How do we respond to them in an appropriate way? Helps kids be successful and healthy and happy. We don't want to suppress any of these, but okay, if we're upset or not feeling good, how do we work that out? Um, this, I will email to, um, 
you later today and we'll post it on our website. All of these resources are targeted for families and home. So often you'll have um, information and you'll say, how do I do that at home? I'm not sure how to do that. So some of these are articles for supporting things at home, a uh, packet to the zones of regulation. That's the color coded um, feelings, sort of signs and check-ins that we use. A book list if you want to read a story that's on a particular subject. Um, whether it's being brave, advocating, or whatnot, there's a nice resource um, for that, as well as an article on it's okay to help your kids lose a game. Not help them lose a game, but not to always win. Um, so now we, we want to hear from you if you have questions. So we thank HCAM for taping us and sharing this with those that couldn't be here today. Thank you, Mike. Mm -hmm.